Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Howard. I'm with the Export Import Bank of the United States. Who are we and what do we do? First of all, we are the Export Import Bank, really the Export Bank of the United States. Um, since this is being filmed, I have to be behave. So we were, we've been around for about 80 years. All the important people are in Washington. We have six sales offices out in the rest of the country. Our job is to deal with companies like you that need to access us. It needs to be to the banker that says, Mike, I hear your programs. How do I really get down into the weeds, under the nitty gritty, how do I use them? The exporter that says, hey, I make this, I'm trying to sell it there, how do I make sure I get paid? The other thing you come to me with is, is this a good buyer? And you'd be surprised how many times I say, that buyer is a stinker. <laughs> Don't sell to that buyer unless you get cash in advance. So I'm an independent third party that is an excellent credit analysis source for deals from $500 to $5 billion. All we do is support the exports of US goods and services. If you wanna talk specifically services, that's another set of expertise that I really need to make sure that you get good at so I can protect you in getting paid. There's really three reasons why somebody would use an XM bank. Every industrialized country in the world has an XM bank. We all do the same thing. We want to make sure that goods and services made in our countries being sold to another country get paid for. So we all do the same thing. In a perfect world, there would be no XM banks out there. Leave the government out, right? It's not a perfect world. We want to make sure you can compete against the Germans, the Italians, the Swiss, the French, the Chinese, and both German XM banks. So what do we do? We really minimize the risk associated with an export transaction. And I'll get into what that really means. We want to level the playing field. If you're at McCormick Place and you're selling your widgets and you've got a good foreign buyer that comes up and says, I want to buy your widgets, and you're a normal Midwest company, you're going to say, I'd be happy to sell you these widgets. Send me the money, and I'll send you the product. The booth next door is a South Korean, the booth next door is a guy from Japan, and they're saying, I'd be happy to sell you my widgets. If you're a good credit worthy buyer, I'll give you 60 or 90 day terms. Would that be easier for you, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer? Please sign here. My job is to talk a lot of you into saying, if that's a good credit worthy buyer, treat them like a world class credit worthy buyer in certain countries. The next thing I do is convince your banker that that foreign buyer or this transaction is just as good as selling to a buyer in Alabama or in Atlanta. In other words, my job is to take the international risk out of the equation so that then the banking community could move forward with their capital. Here are the common areas in which we benefit the financial community and therefore the manufacturing or services community. Inventory financing. You were at the trade show, your person came back with all kinds of international orders to the production line. She says, I got a half a million dollars worth of orders. Let's start cranking on this. The banker says, we have no more availability of funds to increase your inventory for this export sale. The export import bank will say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Banker, here's a guarantee for you. So let's start working out the inventory production because we like the buyer. Short-term accounts receivable. One of the things that most banks in the United States won't do is lend against any foreign receivables. Why? The auditors will, will gig them on it, right? It's against some of the rules as far as the banking regulations. So we say take that asset, turn it into a valuable asset that you can borrow against with the Export-Import Bank on the backside by insuring that receivable. Medium-term financing. One of the questions, again, that I wanted to know from the panel experts is, what is the availability of capital in those countries for a longer period of time? Let's say you're in Panama or you're in Brazil or one of these countries and you wanted to buy a million dollar bottling line. So I'll set the scenario. You're a second tier fruit juice manufacturer. You're starting to really get into other markets. You want a new bottling facility for a million dollars. 
will that local bank give you five-year financing at a reasonable rate, or is it only 24-month financing at 32%? Very interesting question. So you as the export, you, you as the U.S. seller want to make sure that you have the resources within the United States to offer financing to them. You don't want to do it because you want to make sure that you have access to the expertise that can do things like that. Long-term stuff, I don't think under, other than somebody like AAR in the room probably would not take advantage of that. You see this term direct loan up there. I'd have to go on that side of the room to really talk about that. <laughs> so our working capital guarantee, really what it is, it's meant for companies that already have a line of credit with their banker and the bank says, I like my customer but this overseas order is just too much risk for me to take these deals to committee. You guys come in, guarantee me, almost identical to the SBA, and then the production can start. No minimum or maximum, that's a little bit different from the SBA programs. Um, and I think someone may have asked a question to Steve that said the collateral value. It is all 100% collateralized. In other words, this is normal banking operations. If there's a loan, there's got to be stuff behind it that says that there's value. But what we do is that stuff behind it has higher values in our equations than if we're not there. All right, these are just some of the differences between XM and the SBA. Um, I think the last one is interesting. My job is to be fair and honest. A lot of times XM Bank's fees are a little bit higher. It's just the way that it is. Congress said, thou shalt do X, and we have certain boxes that we have to play in and we have to be very profitable okay this is the only federal agency that i know that makes a million three profit per employee that ain't bad short-term insurance what this really does is it takes on two risks my job is to take on two risks the political risk war revolution insurrection loss of license that kind of big macro stuff and then the commercial risk those type of risks that I will say that buyer is a good buyer, go ahead and sell to them. If they don't pay you, I'll pay you. Now, what risk did I not say that I will take as far as XM Bank? Product dispute. If you were supposed to send a left-handed snowblower and you sent a right-handed snowblower, fix it, right? I'm not going to get involved with your relationship or disputes. I want to get in there and say that's a good creditworthy buyer in a reasonable country. It should be a bankable deal. Questions? Yeah, we'll hold questions for a minute. A lot of you will say, what's the difference between XM Bank and the private sector? Why don't we get you guys out of the business altogether? That's fine. The private sector doesn't want 80% of the small business that's in this room. So here are some examples of where XM Bank plays nicely with the private sector. Yesterday I was with some of the giants in the industry. Their comments is we want XM Bank in the pool because what they do is they give us a more sophisticated exporter in this range that now is in our target market or we can bring somebody to XM Bank when our country risk is there, when our tolerance for certain industries is up. So we play very well with the private sectors in these marketplaces. I'm a giant underwriter. Well, I'm a big underwriter, and we have a giant underwriting shop. But what we really do is how do you evaluate the creditworthiness of the buyer in Latin America? One of the questions I was going to ask the panelists before me is if that buyer in Panama, in Brazil, in Colombia gets a call from a credit reporting agency saying there's a U.S. seller that wants to check you out, is that offensive? I learned yesterday in certain countries, that's very offensive. Certain countries, it's not. That's where I would want some of these expertises at the panel level to say, no, that's okay. That may be in Monica's report. Remember when she said the country guides and how terms are done? That's a very good question. I have to have that information. You need to be sensitive as far as how you get it, but I have to have it to be a good underwriter. So up to $100,000 typically, all I need is a couple of decent trade references. If you ask for trade references within certain countries, that's again, is offensive. Outside that country, it's not offensive. 
Up to $300,000, typically an international credit report is what is needed for me to see whether that's a good buyer. What am I looking at? Are there liens, suits, and judgments against that buyer? What reports are good? What reports are bad? What am I really looking for? That's the expertise we bring to the table. All XM banks want to come in there and say, capital equipment manufacturers are important in our country. How do we play well? How do we make sure that US companies are competing? A lot of these trade shows in Latin America that, that people are talking about, the Germans go down there to the show and say, I'm coming with financing. This is a million dollar machine. I'm coming with financing from Germany. And if you buy, you can get five year, seven year financing. American companies rarely do that. My job is to make sure that you know who the buyer is, whether it's a credit worthy buyer, so that we could set the expectations. All in cost of a million dollar bottling line in Latin America, buying from the US with one of the normal providers of credit that we use, probably 10%. What do you think, and this is not meant to be offensive to any of the country experts, what do you think the average interest rate is in Latin America for five-year money if you could get it? Great, that's a wonderful answer. I'm not touching that. <laughs> All right, sorry, I'm gonna jump through a lot of these. A few restrictions. We normally don't do anything that goes boom, okay? Military stuff. We're not open in all the countries. There are some countries that have no money. Sorry, that may not have been real articulate, but they haven't got any money, so we're not going to get paid. So we tend not to sell there. Um, some things, if it's larger orders, we will look and see whether that's an industry that may affect the United States, things like that. There are three exceptions, and since we had Columbia on the panel this morning, I wanted to give you an example, in which I did work on in Miami years ago, and that was attack helicopters that the Colombian government bought from the United States with big old, everybody see Rambo? Remember when that big helicopter came over the cliff and had those big things that shot off the side? Those are the helicopters that we actually financed to Colombia under one of these three um, definitions for drug interdiction. So we can do it, we just need a lot of time and it's not something typically we get involved with. Um, has to be U.S. made stuff, right? This is the, it's part of the federal government. It's financed by our tax dollars. We make a lot of money, but Congress said, thou shall handle U.S. made goods and services. Now, different from the SBA, we don't care if it's foreign owned. So we can, we can finance the subsidiary of a German company for working capital, that's fine, but it still has to be U.S. made stuff. We're open in about 150, 180 countries, depending on what we're trying to do. But one of the things I really want you to do is not chase a bad deal. You're, you'd be surprised how many people are out there chasing their tail, spending thousands and thousands of dollars looking at a bad deal. Get somebody that's an expert at the beginning and do an unfiltered analysis. Does this buyer, is it a reasonable country? Are they a credit worthy buyer? And is it a bankable deal before you spend a lot of money? That's who I am. 